Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. And happy Easter Monday, happy Ramadan, or happy Passover, whichever you celebrate. And if you don't celebrate any of them, uh, well, happy Monday to you. <laughs> well, we are very excited to have this event, the annual uh, three-minute thesis, 3MT for short, in this department. And we are very excited for you to see the outstanding research by our graduate students, the incredible, incredible work they have done. One of the things that has puzzled me throughout the years is that if it takes three minutes to present it, why it takes four years to write it? <laughs> <laughs> I have not found a satisfactory answer to that. But um, so what is 3MT for those of you who are new to this? It is a three-minute presentation that it is accessible uh, to all audience, and it is one static slide. It is not an easy task to do. It requires an enormous amount of practice, of course. And um, we are very proud that in the College of Engineering, actually, we are the only department who has its own three-minute thesis competition. Okay, And it turns out that these events are not a spontaneous reaction. They just don't happen themselves. Uh, one time I, was, I had extra time. I sat at the corner of this room, and I waited for this to happen. <laughs> Nothing happened. So that is the, my way of saying enormous amount of effort goes into this. And um, I would like to recognize here the people who have spent a lot of time on this, including Dr. And Megan Kill Audrey, uh, that she has spent enormous amount of time on this, including preparing this script for me. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, this would be a disaster, believe me. Uh, the second person that I want to recognize is uh, Dr. Eleni uh, Bardaka. Uh, she has um, been uh, spending enormous amount of time on this. And also, Dr. Brina Montoya and Catherine. Uh, Anarda, uh, the reason that I had to pause, uh, I had a good friend, his last name was Andrade, and I always, that, that is a, so I had to, I apologize, but I just wanted to get it right. All right. Uh, all right. So let me just make sure that I didn't miss anything here. Oh, I missed one more thing. How did I end up here? <laughs> so it turns out Dr. Kidal Adri and Dr. Bardaka, they spend an enormous amount of time trying to find some distinguished speaker. They approach one of our faculty members, and uh, they ask her to become the MC for this event. And uh, unfortunately, she had to go to Washington, D.C. to give a presentation in Congress or something like that. Then they approach another faculty, and they ask him to give it to be the MC. And it turns out that he had a keynote speaker in some international conference or something. So they went down the list, and they couldn't find anyone. They approached Dr. Ranjita. They said, Dr. Rangiton, how are we going to solve this? And Dr. Rangiton said, well, you have to change the strategy. You have to go look for someone who is either never in the department, or when he is in the department, he's just goofing around. He was available. <laughs> so you're stuck with me because all the other distinguished ones were busy. Now, am I going to office credit? I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what we've got over here. Of course, we talked about this. Uh, we said that this is one static slide, three minutes. And then uh, next, I, I just wanted to introduce and thank our judges today here. Um, our first judge is Keisha Demps. Uh, she's the Interim Director of Partnerships for NC State University. Thank you for being here. Uh, the next, Chris Bushnell, Marketing and Communication Specialist at Wooten and & Company. 
uh, the firm that built the Carter Finley Stadium. If you have not seen that stadium, it is a magnificent one. Now, our next judge is Joel Chambers. Uh, he's a licensed P at Pickett and Associate specialized in high voltage transmission design. And finally, we have um, Kim Eccles. Uh, she's a licensed P at um, VHB, uh, where she serves as a transportation service leader. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor to have you. Uh, and finally, you get to judge. We have uh, People's Choice Award. Uh, please make sure that you stick around for that so you can uh, vote. Um, after the presentations are over, you have three minutes to cast your vote for that. Uh, there will be a Go link uh, appearing. And then, um, of course, after the event, uh, please join us for the reception. Uh, another logistics, please silence your phone, uh, turn it off, or uh, however you prefer uh, to do so. Um, did I miss anything, Megan? All right. All right. Of course, I'm not following the slides properly. <laughs> I'm horrible, I know. Um, all right. Uh, our first speaker is Ghalib Moktadir. Um, and the title of the presentation is Can We Build Bridges Better? Um, Ghalib is a PhD student in structural engineering. And uh, he works with uh, Dr. Ranjitan, Dr. Kowalski, and Dr. Proestas. Uh, a fun fact about him is that he can cook a mean chicken curry and biryani. Is the food mean or the chicken was mean? <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> without further ado, please, uh, Gala, we would like you to stand sure. right here. Yeah. And the clock is there. Yep. Dr. Montoya will fire up the clock. Sure. And then we go from there. Sure. And hi, how to, do I need to put this? Can you hear me? Oh, that's great. Is it good? OK. OK. Have you ever wondered how many bridges you cross over every week or every month. You may not notice, but when you drive on any highway in the USA, on average, every minute you cross a bridge. According to National Bridge Inventory, there are more than 0.6 million bridges throughout the USA. Bridges are one of the most common and important infrastructures for other developed and developing countries as well. And more than 80% of world's bridges are made of concrete. Construction cost of bridge is pretty high. For example, the average cost to construct a new bridge in the USA is around $250 million. Considering around 1,500 new bridges constructed each year, the amount becomes enormous. On the other hand, the aspect which often gets neglected is the carbon footprint from bridge construction. Concrete industry produces 8% of worldwide greenhouse gases, and bridge construction significantly contributes to it. So this information on cost and carbon footprint indicates the importance of efficient designs of bridge to lower these values. Uh, but in traditional bridge design, designer's main target is to find structurally safe design, not cost or carbon fo footprint optimized one. And in doing so, designers tend to use the traditional types and shapes of different structural parts of the bridge. Designers try to attain some level of cost and environmental impact efficiency by manually iterating over those few design options, but many other possible better designs remain unexplored. So the question is, are most of the world's bridges over-designed? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Then why don't designers search for, search for all other structurally safe designs and finally choose the one with the least cost and least carbon footprint? Well, because it is practically impossible to do it in a manual iterative process. Rather, it demands implementing computational automation and global optimization algorithm, 
And this is what my research is about. I'm developing a computer, computational uh, op uh, optimization framework to find efficient designs of bridges. The, framework, uh, the current version of the software can find efficient designs of the girder part of the bridge that is structurally safe, low cost, and low carbon footprint. And as I continue developing the tool, we envision that adoption of such formal optimization scheme in the practical bridge engineering will help us reduce the overall uh, cost and carbon footprint throughout the world. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Wait. Now, while our judges are uh, filling out the form and they're thinking about uh, the uh, presentation and all of those good things, uh, we have a few slides uh, to share with you, uh, mainly about the uh, previous students who have graduated from here. And uh, uh, we wanted to highlight a few PhD, recent PhD graduates uh, and where they have, they have ended up. Uh, the first one is uh, Megan Johnson. Um, Megan has accepted a postdoctoral fellow, fellow, fellowship in uh, sustainable forest management research with the U uh, US Forest Services. Um, she will be working on the uh, on white land fire and fuel research with the U.S. Forest Services. She will be working with national program leads across multiple research areas to collaborate um, on science delivery initiative and research coordination effort from regional to national levels. All right. Uh, the next student, uh, the next former student, uh, uh, Laura Dalton, uh, she is currently assistant professor in the uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Duke uh, University. Her research uses advanced 3D imaging techniques to investigate how mass moves through porous material like cement and concrete. Uh, I had an opportunity to work with her, and I don't know how she feels about the game between Duke and NC State. <laughs> haven't gotten there yet. Um, I think we need more time. All right. Improv time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I can start dancing, but that's not going to go well. Um, one, of the, one of the games that, that we have played, is, uh, many of you probably haven't heard about this, but some of the professors have heard about this, is that what I want it to be game, right? What did you want to be when you were eight years old? What occupation did you want to choose? At eight, nine, ten, the first occupation that you ever thought you, you were going to choose. Anyone wants to volunteer? There you go. They are close enough. So playing with the stones every day is one of them. Anyone? Anyone else? Anyone else wants to share anything? There you go. I want to be a You wanted to become a MythBuster. Awesome. And why? Because they're awesome. They're awesome. They are. They blow up and stuff. <laughs> I know what Dr. Canapi wanted to be when he was two. He wanted to become a professor. Ooh. <laughs> you, you, you are grounded. <laughs> Well, we are, we are happy that you're a professor. 
All right. Our next presenter is Juan Wang, a PhD student originally from China, spe specializing in transportation systems. She is advised by Dr. Eleni Bardaka. A fun fact about Juan is that she won the first place in the 2019 NCSU Mixed Doubles Badminton Tournament. Only three pairs competed. <laughs> So worst outcome would be the third place. That is a game I want to be in. Uh, now, Joanne is presenting her, uh, her talk on transportation, uh, transportation investment in an economically underdeveloped region. So Joanne, please stand over here. That is a clock. And then, that's it. Should I start? Test, oh, okay. Um, hi, I assume everyone here is familiar with NCDOT, the North Carolina Department of Translation Rights. But have you ever wondered how much budget NCDOT has to work with each year? Well, it's a massive $4.7 billion. This budget is responsible for building and maintaining North Carolina's translation networks. It creates thousands of job opportunities, which may not be related to your job, but as a resident, living here, you definitely benefit from it, like receiving your two-day Amazon delivery. It is uh, safe to say that the translation investments has a huge impact on the local economic, uh, local region and its residents living here. However, regarding its tr the redistribution, the economically, under de economically um, developed regions usually um, take precedence. What if such great amounts of uh, investments goes to the economic underdeveloped regions? That's um, the research question behind my previous research project. In 2015, uh, 1,800 1, kilometers high-speed railway named Lanshan High-Speed Railway was introduced in Western China with a construction cost of $30 billion and um, an estimated direct impact on 8 million people. Um, we estimated the social economic impact of the launching high speed railway, and we found that the launching high speed railway has a significant positive impact on the local economic growth. Um, refer uh, on the economic growth prior to its uh, introduction, conventional railways used to be the preferred travel mode for the long distance trip in this area because of the affordability of air travel. But after the luncheon has been the operation, the residents had a, a more affordable and uh, uh, travel options. They can pay $80 for this 10 hours trip. Now, is it worse to have significant amount of investments in economic underdeveloped regions? From the cost-benefit perspective, the answer may be no, because such projects have been known to lose money each year. However, from the social economic perspective, the answer, the benefits may be significant, because they can foster the economic growth, and uh, they can provide uh, more travel options to residents in this area. Um, more important, we don't know what would happen in the future. Bye. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, just break on this out. We have a few of the, uh, uh, again, a few of more of our former graduate students, PhD students, uh, if you're wondering where they are. Um, of course, uh, Sharif Abubakr, um, he's a project manager at EM Structural Engineers here in Raleigh. Um, he leads a team of engineers on bridge design and other infrastructure projects. Uh, James East, 
Um, he's a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. He is continuing his research in modeling emissions and air quality. His current project uses satellite imagery to quantify global methane emissions. That's pretty cool. Maybe I should go a little bit slower. Yeah. Pause in between. All right. Thomas Na has accepted a position as a senior staff professional engineer at Geosynthetic uh, Consultant in Georgia. His responsibilities include a broad range of geotechnical and geoenvironmental projects. I'm running out of options over here. I'm joking. All right, we heard, uh, we heard about playing with the stone, Mythbusters, pilot turned professor. Who else wants to share? Oh, I thought everyone knows that. No? I wanted to become a chef. Not any type of chef. I wanted to become a kebab chef. <laughs> really? Like the, skewers. the skewers, yeah. And you know, I'm originally from Iran, and all the kebabs are made on the skewers, right? And the talent of a chef is measured by how long their grill is, how many they can handle at a given time. I wanted a three meter one. You gotta take a cap from one end to the other. Cool. Well, you didn't. A ballpark, right? Chemistry, engineering. Are you still play with beakers? Uh, is that are you still playing with the toy beakers? What kind of research are you doing? Nanograms per liter. <laughs> Using nano beakers. <laughs> You need a scanning electron microscope to see the speaker. All right. Let me figure out our next speaker. You ready, Lucas? All right. Our next speaker is Lucas Lima. Lucas is a PhD student in structures and materials, and uh, his advisor is Dr. Tasneem Hassan. He's originally from Brazil. No, he does not play soccer. I'm joking. Do you play soccer? Uh, I try to. I try to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was not written here, so I went out. <laughs> uh, his favorite hobby is going to gym and then having something sweet to eat right after that. <laughs> Lucas Stag is titled "Small Sample, Big Impact." So. Do you remember what you did yesterday? Oops. Just like. <laughs> he had one job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so scared not to mute this microphone when I'm talking to myself there that I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the kebab thing is not working. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to go back to being a kebab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just be careful not to burn the kebabs. <laughs> Do you remember what you did yesterday? To sustain our lifestyle, each person in America had in average a carbon footprint of 75 pounds of CO2 only yesterday. But... With the escalating global warming, it's crucial to reduce this number. And with 80% of the world's electricity still coming from fossil fuels, we need to find cleaner alternative. 
nuclear energy already is one of the best options, with a carbon footprint that is comparable to wind, and it's much cleaner than solar energy, for example. But we can make the nuclear energy much more efficient than that. However, to do so, we would need to reach temperatures close to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit inside the reactors. And this temperature is enough to melt materials like copper, aluminum, and many of the alloys currently used in reactor structures. So we need to develop new alloys to resist these temperatures. But new alloys can only be produced in small volumes, which is not enough to produce even one standard specimen for tests. So the process of obtaining material data becomes very slow because of this. So to accelerate this process, we thought, shouldn't we replace the standard specimen by much tinier samples? Because then we can produce many more tiny samples with the same amount of material as one standard specimen and produce a large volume of material data much more quickly. But the existing testing machines don't have the precision for these tiny samples. So the solution we came up with was to develop completely from scratch our own miniature test machine. This equipment applies a very high temperature and forces to the specimen to mimic the reactor environment. So, uh, and it's also such a compact equipment that we can fit inside a microscope so we can understand the structure of the material at the micro level during the test, which wasn't possible with the large samples. So far, our test and computational models show that the data from the miniature samples can be used to show the properties of the big sample, which is encouraging. So in summary, the use of tiny samples can speed up material development that will make safer, much more efficient nuclear reactors for a cleaner future. And with that, we can reduce that daily carbon footprint weight of 75 pounds from our shoulders, from our lungs, and from our corneas. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. All right. So we have uh, three of our more uh, former PhD graduates. Um, Mor uh, Morgan DeCarlo, she's a senior analyst at Catmus Consulting. In her role, she provides uh, contract support to the Environmental Protection Agency. Am I on the right slide? Okay. Uh, her favorite pro pro uh, project is leading tasks under Lead uh, Service Line Accelerator Program, which uh, was recently launched at the White House. Right. Uh, Chian Liu is a postdoctoral fellow at the Antlinger Center for Energy and Environment at Princeton University. I probably butchered the name of the center there. She's using modeling tools to analyze the impact of different policies on the energy system. And uh, I'm confused. I think we need a little bit more time. So anyone wants, anyone wants to follow up to the nano beakers? <laughs> so astronaut. astronaut. Awesome. Why? Star Wars is cool. Star Wars is cool. No, it still is cool. It still is cool. <laughs> so by the time I was about 13, I was too tall to go on the shuttle. So there's a height call. Oh, there he is. I did not know that. Yeah, 
fashion designer. Oh, that is cool. And how did you end up becoming an environmental engineer? Fashion wasn't cool enough? <laughs> I agree with that. So we didn't have anyone else wanted to become a chef? <laughs> so you wanted the toys. You really didn't want to become a scientist. <laughs> I joke, girl. <laughs> All right. Our next presenter is um, Sean Daly, a newly minted, minted PhD. Uh, as of this morning. <laughs> He defended his dissertation this morning, working with Dr. Angela Harris. Uh, Sean works in the Global Wash Sanitation and Hygiene Cluster. Um, his talk titled, Improving Water Sanitation Hygiene Monitoring. This time, I will make sure to advance the slide. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So in the last 23 years, over 2 billion people have gained access to high quality drinking water. But scenarios like you see in this photo behind us uh, are still very common. People face difficult decisions and complex decisions when it comes to their drinking water, such as deciding between sources that vary both in quality and in quantity, or having to rely on sources that must be boiled or disinfected before use. And these issues are critical as over 800,000 people died of wash related illnesses in 2016 alone. Now, typically, intervention strategies to address this sort of issue come in the form of supplying new water and sanitation infrastructure to a community, but the benefits from these uh, interventions are inconsistent. Now, why would providing improved water and sanitation infrastructure fail to improve a population's health? Because individuals are falling through the gaps in the monitoring schemes. In my research here at NC State, I've addressed this problem with two primary methods, conducting exposure assessments and using molecular biology techniques. To conduct their exposure assessment, I take primary data that myself and my group and my collaborators have produced, or secondary data from published literature, and con uh, use this data to conduct thousands or even tens of thousands of scenarios, uh, which we can consolidate all of these results to get a wide range of exposure outcomes. And from this wide range of exposure outcomes, we can um, consolidate all the data to make conclusions about water-related behaviors. Primarily, we determine that when households face unreliable water access, they tend to use multiple sources to meet their needs. And when this happens, um, they can face exposure to unsafe drinking water, which can raise their exposure to fecal contamination over the course of a year, such that it means that their access to improved water no longer provided any benefit at all. Additionally, we found that when individuals boil the water at very high efficiencies, they can still be exposed to um, fecal contamination and antimicrobial resistance on a daily basis. We also collected animal feces, uh, human feces, and drinking water samples from Kenya, and I extracted DNA and RNA from these samples and used PCR-based analysis methods to identify that animal feces is a pathway that's parallel to wash for enteric pathogens that are considered kind of wash-related diseases. Uh, that, and these, this animal pathway is not con uh, included in the traditional wash framework of water, sanitation, and hygiene. All the research that I've conducted here at NC State has identified gaps in the current monitoring scheme um, for global water sanitation and hygiene access and must be included in global monitoring efforts moving forward uh, in order for the goals and the spirit of, um, excuse me, the spirit of global development goals to be met. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.
All right, a few of a uh, few more of our uh, recent PhD graduates. Um, Jessie Thangtham, uh, she uh, uh, she just finished her PhD with Dr. Mervyn Kowalski in structural engineering and mechanics. She's a now postdoctoral fellow at Georgia Tech. Uh, she is testing and modeling structural components for transportation and force protection systems and preparing for, uh, to apply for faculty positions. Uh, Asmita Narodi, she, uh, she just finished her PhD in environmental engineering with Dr. Barlas. She recently accepted a role um, as a research environmental engineer at RTI International. She will, be work, uh, she will be working with the sustainable materials management team conducting analysis characterizing the cost and environmental impacts of waste management strategies. All right. I think we need a little bit more time. Anyone else wants to share what they want it to be? Or anyone else has more interesting game than this <laughs> boring one that I'm continuing for, for a long time? Anyone wants to share? Dr. Gibson. Be a journalist. Journalist. Yes, an environmental journalist. Wow, that is cool. And you're yes, science, science journalist now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Joselskis, how about you? I'm putting him on a spot. Aren't I? Disney Princess. That's a very hard job. I try too. Yeah, walking in the hills. I was a slightly horizontally challenged for that job. <laughs> All right, we're good. All right, fantastic. All right. I'm just trying to make sure not mess up anything more than what I have done before. All right. <laughs> Our next presenter is uh, Samia Sharma. Um, uh, PhD student in transportation engineering. She's originally from India. She's advised by doctors George List and Billy Williams. Uh, a fun fact about her is that she is trilingual. Wow. She can speak Hindi, English, and uh, Tihagu? Telugu. Telugu. Uh, I can't even pronounce the name of the language. <laughs> um, her, present, her presentation title is, It's Shop O'Clock Somewhere, Impacts of E-Commerce on Transportation. Without further ado, Hi, everyone. Did you know that one of the things that you have on your person right now is probably purchased online? It's true. It could be the phone in your pocket, the watch on your wrist, or the shoes on your feet. With the explosive growth of e-commerce, our shopping habits are rapidly changing. But have you ever stopped to think of the impact of this trend on our transportation system? The truth is that just as e-commerce is changing the way we shop, it's also changing the way we move. However, most transportation planning models do not incorporate e-commerce-related trips into their analysis. 
This is also true of the Triangle Regional Planning Model that covers the areas of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. That's where my research comes in. I've developed a new method to incorporate e-commerce-related trips into planning models. My method is easy to adopt, uses no data collection, and by using existing travel survey data, I've estimated how much people shop online and how many truck trips that would generate. Uh, it also adds existing Amazon sortation facilities into the planning network, so now you have these warehouse locations added into your network. The results of this analysis help paint a picture of how travel patterns are changing as a result of e-commerce, and now uh, transportation planners can assess what-if scenarios like what happens to traffic congestion on major freeways if a new uh, warehouse is added in Garner, what happens to overall air quality if uh, e-commerce grows by 10%. This information is crucial to planners and policymakers because it helps them assess how much funding is needed going in the future. So the next time you're buying something online, Think about how much it is going to affect your, the future of transportation. Thank you. Well, another one of our uh, recently graduated PhD, PhD student is Mehdi Haznat, uh, graduated from PhD in Transportation Engineering and was advised by Dr. Eleni Bardaka. Um, he, is, um, uh, he is a travel model developer uh, for Bentley Systems. In his role, um, he develops systems um, he develops a state-of-the-art agent-based travel demand model software. Software set. Uh, very cool. I know what Dr. Ranjitan is thinking right now. He's thinking that it would have been nice if you read through this script one time. <laughs> would have taken only five minutes. <laughs> is that what you were thinking, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, Adi Keskar, uh, Adi completed his PhD in energy system under the guidance of Dr. Jeremiah Johnson. He recently accepted a role as a public utilities engineer three uh, with the North Carolina Utilities Commission. In his role, he will provide the utility commission with expert technical uh, counsel in matters concerning the regulation of investor-owned public utilities. All right. Now I have a question for you. What year NC State was found? Yes. <laughs> 1887. What day? <laughs> uh, don't, don't, look at, don't look at your ring. Don't look at your ring. What day? Oh, I got you, huh? I just searched it. <laughs> it is in March. You're right. Oh, wow. You're good. Angie, you just, you just searched it and you tell, told her? You got it right. Wow. I'm impressed. The odd, yeah. Wow. The odd is 112 times 1 over 30. Is a what? 101? Yeah. If, if you were guessing, that would be the odd. I was going to say a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> better odds. Yeah, better odds. I'm going to ask you another question. While we're, uh, we're done? I'm going to keep that question for the next round then. All right. Because that is a fun one. All right. My pages are not in order. <laughs> All right. 
Our final talk today is by Stephanie Starr. Stephanie is a PhD student in environmental engineering working with Dr. Canapi, the pilot guy. Uh, he is originally from a small town of 800 people in Germany. A fun fact about Stephanie is that she has parachuted out of planes. They were perfectly sound functioning planes, <laughs> just for the record. Her talk uh, is titled Breaking the Forever Cycle. Right now, most of us in this room have something very unnatural inside our bodies. It was created with good intention, but could potentially be harmful. This something is called PFAS, or forever chemicals. At first glance, these chemicals have amazing properties. They keep our fried eggs from sticking to our non-stick frying pans when whipping up Sunday morning breakfast. They keep our feet dry when hiking the Blue Ridge Mountains in our waterproof boots on a rainy afternoon. But they're also in our water, and they're harmful. Even small doses of these chemicals have been linked to a wide range of health problems, including cancer. Fortunately, though, we are effectively able to remove these chemicals from our drinking water by using granular activated carbon filters. It sounds great, right? But now these chemicals are stuck to the activated carbon. We solved one problem, but created another. So what can we do? We can destroy these chemicals by putting the used carbon filters into very large, large hot furnaces. This, again, sounds fantastic, right? But during this process, we may be creating harmful air emissions. That's why I'm developing methods that safely break down PFAS in granular activated carbon filters that have been used to clean contaminated drinking water. Um, the questions I hope to answer are, how do PFAS break down when heat is applied to them? What contaminants do we see in air emissions? And are they hazardous? And can we pre-treat the activated carbon in a way to facilitate the complete destruction of PFAS that way? The, what, the good news is, what I've seen so far in my research is um, very promising. We can soak the activated carbon and then heat it. During this process, most PFAS breaks down into components that we can then safely remove with ex existing air pollution control devices. Another exciting um, uh, uh, treatment method we can do is we can pre-treat the activated carbon with caustic soda or lime. Here, over 80% of PFAS breaks down into salts that we can then safely remove from the filters. But more work, more work needs to be done. Because if we want to break these forever chemicals into something that is safe, they will no longer be forever, and we can break the forever cycle. And we will also be able to reuse the activated carbon to remove more PFAS from our drinking water. All right, now, uh, oh, yeah, the clock is already started. <laughs> You've got three minutes. You don't have to give a presentation. You just need to take your phone out or your laptop out and go to this Go link, three empty people's choice, and vote for your favorite presentation. Um, I assume the presenters can vote as well? Yeah. Not for themselves, but feel free to vote. I'm joking, of course. Uh, feel free to vote. The clock is ticking.
while you're voting, here is an interesting question. Who was the first student at NC State? On March 7th, 1887. It was a <laughs> Who was the first student ever registered at NC State? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Here's one vote for Albert Einstein. <laughs> what was that? Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Uh, shares a W with the wolf. Walter Matthews. You can search this and you will find it. Apparently, he, he's from Asheville. He was from Asheville and he hopped on the train, took the train to Raleigh and went and registered. Years later, there was a question, and I'm not making this up. It looks like there's something that I'm making this up. But years later, there was a question, who was the first student? And he said, I was. That was the entire proof. <laughs> there, is no, there is no documentation at all, because he claimed it. Uh, all right. Why that is a stock at 290? <laughs> Everyone has casted their vote? Not yet? <clears throat> now, while you're voting, um, and we are working on the scores over there. I think I'll hand it over to Dr. Ranjitan uh, for graduate awards, for um, basically departmental graduate awards. Uh, do we need to go to the next one? I didn't make the presentation. Don't look at me like that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, I like to optimize, so which means we try to double up every time we have. So while they are tallying up the three empty winners and uh, the scoring, uh, we're going to announce the graduate uh, awards um, based on input that we have received from faculty uh, so far. And <clears throat> so I will announce the name uh, and the award. And if you are here, please walk up here. And if you have uh, your advisor here, or your faculty sponsor, or anybody else that you'd like to take a photo with, please come up here. Otherwise, we'll have the unfortunate situation of having to take a photograph with me. So, <laughs> And the most important thing, those who are getting the award, uh, so that you get a certificate which is a fake certificate. So you will get the real one when you meet Jody, and she will print with the proper name and all of that. And most importantly, that doesn't entice you. You get your cash award only by seeing her so she can tell you how to get the money to you. All right? What so do the advisors get? Uh, nothing. <laughs> a a bragging rights. They get the bragging rights. So, so I'm going to read the names uh, and the awards in alphabetical order. Uh, the first uh, recipient is Nancy Lee Alexander. Uh, she's a PhD student in uh, environmental engineering, working with Dr. Kanape. Uh, she is getting, receiving the Charles Smallwood Graduate Award for her excellence in research, teaching, and service. Next is Yazid al uh, He was a PhD student. He graduated uh, in environmental engineering, uh, working with Dr. Call. Uh, he's receiving the Charles Smallwood Graduate Award for his impressive research and scholarly accomplishments. I know he's not here. So. <laughs> Next is uh, Ashley Bittner, who is a PhD student 
uh, in environmental engineering, uh, working with Dr. Andy Grishop. Uh, she's receiving the Griffin Graduate Award for her research accomplishments and service activities. Next is Minerva Bonilla. Uh, she is a PhD student in construction engineering, working with Dr. William Rastoff. She's receiving the David Johnston Graduate Award for her perseverance and achievements in academics, research, teaching, and engagement. Next is uh, Chandra Moli, who is a PhD student uh, in water resources engineering, uh, working with Dr. Shankar Armugam. Uh, he's receiving the Coffee Graduate Award for his excellence in research and their impact on practice. You are the, you are the unfortunate one. Next is uh, Lan Chang, a uh, PhD student working with uh, Dr. Kanapi in environmental engineering, uh, receiving the Coffee Graduate Award for her innovative spirit, research excellence, and service contributions. Uh, not the last letter is not an E. <laughs> uh, next is Harin Chen Choi, uh, who's a PhD student working with Dr. Pogas in the structural engineering and mechanics area. Uh, he's receiving the Smith Gardner Award for his research accomplishments and innovation, as well as his mentorship to his t teammates. Next is Boris Goenaga, uh, he's a PhD student working with uh, Dr. Shane Underwood and Cassie Castorina in the transportation materials engineering area, and he's receiving the Coffee Graduate Award for his interdisciplinary skills and achievements and his mentorship for his mate, uh, teammates. Next is uh, Jessica Gorski. Uh, she's a master's student uh, in the coastal engineering area, working with Casey Dietrich. She's receiving a Charles Smallwood Graduate Award for her leadership in coastal erosion research and its promotion, its and its inclusion uh, in diverse communities. Any volunteers? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Next is uh, Yaji Liu, a PhD student in construction engineering, uh, working with Dr. Kevin Hahn, and she's receiving the David Johnson Graduate Award for her achievements in research and contributions in teaching and service.
I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, catch the faculties there. It's co-advised by Dr. William Dressdorf and uh, Kevin Hahn. Uh, next is uh, Thomas Na. Uh, you saw him up on the screen earlier. Uh, he uh, graduated uh, or graduating with um, a PhD in geotechnical engineering, uh, working with Dr. Montoya and Dr. Cabaz, uh, and he's receiving the Griffin Graduate Award in recognition of his scholarly excellence, mentorship, and fellowship. Next is Ramin Niramond. Uh, he's a PhD student in transportation systems engineering, working with Dr. Ali Hajbabe and Leila Hajbabe, uh, receiving the Bruce Edwards Matthews Award for his outstanding achievements in research. You're better dressed than I am. So. <laughs> Next is Adam Smith, who is a PhD student in transportation systems engineering, working with uh, Dr. Eleni Bardaka. Uh, he is receiving the Bruce Edwards Matthews Award for his excellence in academics, research, and leadership. And for his photography. <laughs> and next is uh, Jamil Udin, who is a PhD student in construction engineering, working with uh, Dr. Albert, Alex Albert, and he is receiving the David Johnson Graduate Award for his contributions in research and teaching. Well, congratulations to everyone. I think I'm, I, I think I'm not going to mess this up. <laughs> I will try. Although, do not underestimate my powers to mess things up. Uh, all right. The votes are in. The People's Choice Board votes are in, as well as, uh, again, thank you to our judges. Uh, so the, we will start with the People's Choice Award. The People's Choice Award goes to Stephanie Starr. Congratulations. I told you, do not underestimate me. <laughs> it's all his fault. Uh, the second uh, place goes to Samia Sharma. Congratulations. Okay. 
All right. Now, uh, I should have mentioned this before. I, I, I just realized this when I was looking at these total score number over here. These have, this have been an extremely close competition, right? We are talking about one point here and there, a few points here and there, out of 160-something. Uh, so th this has been a very, very close competition. Uh, the first uh, place goes to Lucas Lima. Congratulations. Fantastic. Actually, uh, Lucas told me right before this, if he wins the competition today, he's going to have the suite without going to gym. <laughs> I just made that up. I, I just, I'm just putting words in his mouth. Uh, finally, um, I just wanted to one more time. Uh, this doesn't go back, right? I don't know a better way. If you know, let me know. I just wanted to one more time to thank our judges. Thank you very much for being here and all your efforts. Thank you. Now, uh, this concludes the event today. Of course, we have a reception right after this outside, right? Uh, I did not make the choice of food and stuff like that. So if you have comments about those, I'm the innocent guy. Um, and thank you for, for being here. Uh, was that? No kebabs. No kebabs today. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. We are very, very proud of this event uh, in our department. And thank you for participating.